Total Primer is back-to-back -back conversations with someone passionate about their work and passionate about someone else's work. Mostly art and mostly Atlanta. I'm your host, Sean Mills. Georgia is one of two places in the United States to have rare earth metals found in a mine. And then, like, the next paragraph is, but it's not a gold rush. And uh, the reason is that, like, these, the most rare earth metals, like diprosium and medium and these other things, they're most primarily used for um, nuclear um, power plants or nuclear weapons, like the most magnetic materials in the world. <laughs> so the U.S., like, g like, stamped it out before it even began and said, like, you're not allowed to, to, I mean, <laughs> to no like, experiment. Yeah. Security or, like, as an engineer, I have a little bit of, like, a nuanced and I think I kind of have like mixed feelings about mining in general and the fact that the government might squash it. I don't know if I'd necessarily feel bad about that. Um, I mean, mining tends to be pretty exploitative in general and kind of like a boom and bust mentality um, with a lot of that in general. And um, I don't, I don't, I've never heard of like research being squashed or, uh, things being hindered because of rare earth metals being rare, not having access to them, right? Like, I think we have pretty good understanding of the rare earth metals and some of the technology. So to someone in a perspective, you know, like I, to me that almost sounds like a little bit of a hyperbole, right? That they're just, those are guys that are looking to get rich. They could care less about furthering research or new technologies, from the mining standpoint. You know, the mines, they're mining already, right? Like, mm -hmm. all sorts of mines around the world. And so, like, this mine had access to these minerals, and they were just throwing them away, basically, <laughs> because, like, they're, like, America's not set up for refining it and getting into a place where you could use it in a viable fashion. Hmm. So they're actually shipping it to China because it just got profitable enough for them to bother mm -hmm. because, like, there isn't, like, a industry for doing it in America. Mm -hmm. um, and that was part of the thing was that it's like 99% of all this stuff is found in China. So like we'd like, we don't even want to get involved. Like we'll never catch up. So like, don't even bother kind of thing. Interesting. Um, but in terms of like the exploiting, like the exploiting is already happening. <laughs> like it's just, you know, imagine if you found a diamond while you're looking for nickel and like you have to decide, is it worth bothering to check if this is profitable? I'll just stick to my nickel. Sure. Right. And those guys, they don't, they could care less about furthering technology or not. They just want to sell as much of whatever they can extract out of the ground. Right. That any refining or technology that comes like way downstream <laughs> from those guys. So uh, from their point, I think it's, it's hype to just make their case to be able to sell, uh, to sell it. So that's interesting though. I am, I'm curious to read a little bit more about it. Yeah. Um, and is this something that's happening very recently or yeah, it was just now, like, like, yeah, just like in February I'll, I'll post the link. Wow. Yeah. And where do you know what parts of Georgia in particular? Did they yeah. mention that? Uh -huh. Like is it the Kennesaw mine down the road from my house over here? Or is it that big <laughs> aggregate strip mine over here uh, that close by? I, the, this article was covering the one near the Okafnoki swamp. So like oh, down okay. south. Yeah. yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. There's a couple of Vulcan mines for like aggregates up around here in North Georgia. Um, and did you know that the first gold rush in the U.S. was in Georgia? Yeah, I think I probably heard it in one of those trivia games, <laughs> but I don't yeah. know much more about it. Yeah, than and like Dahlonega, mm -hmm. just up, you know, up north of Atlanta, um, was like a, a mining town, and the, uh, the little North Georgia college that's up there, their little steeple is plated with Georgia gold, and the dome at the Capitol Dome down in Atlanta is plated with Georgia gold. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Yeah, for sure. Well, uh, well, welcome to Double Primer episode number 39. I'm your host, Sean, with Tanju. And Tanju, right. what's, uh, what's trending in your world? Number 39. Excellent. Um, yeah, so this one caught me off guard a little bit. Twitter trending moments. Uh, we're recording a day later than usual. This week, right? It's Thursday, so I got an extra day, and this showed up last night on the, my Twitter moments, um, which is that the Olympic Committee has recommended four new sports for the 2024 Summer Games. 
Uh, and that includes now uh, – these are still under consideration, so it's not official, but there are strong chances you're going to end up there skateboarding, uh, sport rock climbing, uh, surfing, and break dancing. So the rock climbing one in particular is relevant to me that that's um, being considered now. Uh, rock climbing is actually going to be in the 2020 Olympics next year uh, in Tokyo, but it's kind of this weird – combine three different disciplines of rock climbing all combined into one. So it's actually caused a lot of controversy in the climbing community because just like all athletes at an elite levels, they they tend to specialize and it's like this thing of it's kind of getting watered down, right? That not necessarily the best athlete in a particular class is going to be winning, but it's somebody that's able to manage, um, kind of manage themselves to, to be good enough in all three different categories, right? Uh, I don't know if that, that makes sense or if you can imagine like they only have one running category and they got to do sprints, hurdles, and marathons, right? <laughs> and the, a combined score of those three is who wins the gold medal. Um, but it sounds like now in 2024, they're actually looking to split it to get, get sport climbing, which is one of the types of climbing, to be its own individual category. So that's pretty exciting to see that. And um, the Twitter trending, in particular at the moment, has a guy breakdancing on his head as the uh, GIF, GIF that's associated with this. So that's kind of cool, too, to see that. Uh, I can't imagine uh, well, skateboarding is also kind of blows my mind how far skateboarding's come in 30 years compared to when I was a kid. Skateboarding was a crime. And in the 80s, right, skateboarding was a crime, a very counterculture. And now it's, it's gotten as far as being in the Olympics. It's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. And in general, like, there's a lot of politics concerning what is a sport and what isn't a sport. Yeah, absolutely. Within a sport, like, the emphasis. So um, there's a track record of, like, female gymnastics being an issue. How, are you familiar with female gymnastics at all? A little bit. So it, it just strikes me as a parallel to the rock climbing because, um, like, there are different events for the men's and the women's. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's a sort of critique that uh, female gymnastics are really pushed towards what are quote unquote considered really feminine things. So like they de-emphasize raw strength and emphasize like agility. Yeah. Which is why has like it's been controversial that seemingly like 13 year old girls are like the top competitors right now uh -huh. versus like adult women of what we typically consider adult women. Like if you look at their their body cannon. So there's like a similar parallel, I think with the climbing where it's like, you're basically telling the, the amateur climbing community, like this is what climbing is by giving someone a gold medal. Right. So oh, that's, yeah. That's... You're defining these, these standards. There's concern about the money and the attention that's going to bring like climbing. It's very much like skateboarding was almost like a counterculture, like a, definitely a subculture kind of thing against authority and now to have and like rigor that like the Olympic Springs and all the politics that Olympic Springs. So yeah, it's going to be interesting, but overall I'm still pretty excited about it. Right. <laughs> and like you mentioned skateboarding. So like that's transferred over from X games because right. the premise was that it was something different than your grandpa's exactly. downhill skiing. Yeah. But at least, yeah, what's interesting though is at least X games has been around for at least like 20 years, right? A long time, at least more than a decade. Um, I don't think rock climbing has been on any kind of that level of com competitive climb. I mean, there's been competitive climbing for years, but not on the level like X Games. And um, I think even part of this combined format was them trying to tinker with how do you make it interesting to non-climbers, right? To to televise it. I think it's all ad, ad revenue against it. Uh, so, this I was reading an article even before this news came out about about uh, this coming up in 2020 and who the potential contenders are and how this weird format they got does definitely add to the drama because you have to like calculate points and people have to manage their um, kind of their performance and their fatigue levels right and their energy levels and sort of like just be good enough to advance but not get completely burned out when or one or different class and that, and that makes it exciting. Right. And like all these tournaments, like whether it's final four that's going on right now or in the soccer tournaments, world cup, there's this element of like calculating all the different ways that teams can advance, you know, like doing a little bit of that simple math of like 
this team wins and this team loses and there's this differential, then whoever I want gets to advance or they're going to be technically out, right, even before they're out. And that, that adds to the drama of the whole spectacle, the whole thing. And it sounds like that that's going to be happening, at least for rock climbing um, in 2020, and then we'll see how that evolves into the future. So, Well, speaking of climbing, is that like a natural time to discuss like what's going on with your hangboards? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And it like it's so rare to see something trending on Twitter that hits so close to home for me. <laughs> um usually it's it's a little more uh from a distance, but yeah, the hangboard uh thing is um I'd say it feels like it's picking up a little bit of steam. I actually so- sold my second hangboard tonight. Actually gave it to somebody and got some cash for it, so that was pretty cool. Um, it's a hangboard that's going down to a rock gym in, in Tallahassee, Florida for a little competition event they're doing there and it's being raffled off to benefit, um, the Southeast Climbers Coalition, which is a local advocacy group that helps protect, uh, climbing areas, um, outdoor climbing areas. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, a guy actually was willing to buy it. Um, everybody's still, when they see them and they get their hands on them, it's, thinks they're really cool so i get that real positive tangible feedback which is pretty awesome uh, and then i've actually made a couple others recently that i've that i've donated and given away so i've i've given away more hangboards and i've actually sold them only sold two <laughs> which makes me wonder you know if i'm doing things right or not but uh it's still fun which is cool <clears throat> um and that actually kind of leads me into one of the things i want to discuss today too uh was another thing i saw on on uh, on Instagram that the triggers some things I've been wondering in my head as I was working on these things about um, like when I'm making this hangboard, some of it's digitally designed and then it's cut by a machine in kind of an automated way. But then I finally end up painting them by hand um, and painting it by hand is something I'm, I'm still struggling with. And I was thinking about a couple episodes ago when we were talking about the stencils, you were asking me about why I like stencils or why I wouldn't try doing something by hand, right? And I like it just seems like no matter how hard I try, I end up getting paint where I don't want it. Right? <laughs> Little splotches or it ends up on my hand that I'm not aware of until it's not until I actually touch a spot where I'm like, wait, there's paint on my hand. What the heck? Um so that's been a struggle, um, keeping up with that. Um making all kinds of little mistakes. And again, some of these ones that I'm giving away, I'm like, do I, do I want to put a lot of time into fixing these mistakes or people think these things are, I'm getting good feedback. Like they don't see the mistakes the way I see the mistakes. Right. Um, and I got to thinking about like, am I being lazy or not? Right. Or like, am I putting in the effort to make the, the most perfect thing I could possibly make? Right. Cause this, this is like an expression of me or, uh, you know, I've, I've often heard in my life where people say like, oh, if I can't do a good job or whatever, like I'm, it's not, I'm not worth doing it. Not worth my time doing it. If I can't like stand behind it, be proud about it. So I saw this comic on Twitter, on Instagram about, uh, it's an artist web comic. The whole theme, I don't want to read every single panel, but he's kind of riffing on being accused of being a lazy artist or that web comic got, or a comic artist are considered lazy artists. And he kind of picks apart some comic around the lazy artist thing. And for the last couple of weeks, that's something that's been in my mind as I'm working on these hangboards of like, am I being lazy about fixing this defect or this thing or not? Um, I was curious your perspective. If is that's something that you faced as an artist with either being accused of being lazy or, or seen that as uh, something that artists face from yeah. time to time. Yeah, for sure. And yeah. so like, That's, like, such a huge topic. Like, I could talk for hours on it. But, like, so I think uh, it's – the biggest thing is that there's no expectations, like, um, for for an individual or from the society. Like, it it reminds me to be, like, really uh, dramatic. It's like the Vietnam War. (laughs) Like, we we, – we lost the Vietnam War because we chose to lose it. <laughs> like, we had the military might to, like, carpet bomb Vietnam from a distance, right? <laughs> mm. And we just didn't, we weren't invested as a society. And it wasn't even a war, it was a military action. <laughs> and mm. the reason I, I use that as a metaphor is because um, if you if you studied the rise of NASA, which, you know, in the same space, you know, in the same generation, JFK said we're going to land on the moon, right? Mm-hmm. Well, 
between Eisenhower and um, us landing on the moon, you know, if you go back and look at it, like the American education system was nothing, and then all of a sudden we had computers. Like, once we decided we wanted to do it, like Eisenhower grew up in a schoolroom without a floor, like a dirt floor. And it was very common if you had a lot of kids in your town, instead of building a better school or having two teachers, you would just have two shifts, a morning shift and a night <laughs> shift. Like it's, wow. it, like, it's one of those things where it's like, no, within your lifetime, segregation happened. And similarly, like, within your lifetime, we went from religion, like, studying religion at, at Harvard, to studying chemistry at Harvard. Like, wow. it, it was like a paradigm shift that once we decided to change it, it changed. And so that's the way I think about art is that from the bo- top down, the bottom up, like you hear it all the time now, like there's, they give you this little bit of lip service with steam that it's like, we'll throw an A in the STEM. But like right. the first thing that gets cut is the art program. Oh and, yeah. And if, if you're told from an early age that art doesn't matter, how are you going to find like the education to educate yourself? And right. so if society doesn't expect anything from you, you're not going to expect anything from yourself and you're going to be quote then, unquote lazy. Yeah. Which, but then that's like coming back to an expectation thing though, right? That there is a, this like underlying, like there's, it's not valued, but there's still an expectation of it. Is the perspective I was, I was seeing, especially reading this comic made me think about it. And, and um, you know, as I was working on painting these things, these hangboards, it, some of them, like this one that I just did for the Tallahassee Rock Gym, I noodled on a design with the guy that wanted to buy it and the, the owner of the gym, and he picked the design. Uh, and I was like gung-ho about like, yeah, I can totally do this. And as I actually built it, I was like, ooh, this one this one is becoming like particularly tedious due to like some little little design elements of it. And the font that I just copied a font that they had is a little bit of like a cursive style font. And I didn't. I didn't want to – I got lazy and didn't modify the font to make it wider, so I kind of just left it as is. But, like, trying to paint that became very difficult and tedious, and I, I felt like there was some elements of, like, me being lazy um, about what I did with it or, or not wanting to repeat that, right, or, or wanting to charge more for it or whatever. I think um, that word tedious is a it's a watchword for me. So, like – yeah, like, so I think – your success, if I could call it that, comes from you learning success in other fields and then transferring it over to your hobby. That's the uh-huh. way I interpret it. That okay. like you have a minimum level of like expectations for your craft and like uh-huh. you're you're monitoring like oh this is starting to get tedious so I either need to change my price or I need to change the way I do it. Or the technique, yeah. Um, oh whereas God. most artists are like hobbyists or like something between a hobbyist and a professional. Mm-hmm. And you'll often hear like that they undercharge or like that it's like they're doing it for friends and then it's like yeah like they 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 will just eat into their own profits before they would ever imagine you know reevaluating the whole process. Um, huh. So like I think like that tediousness. Two things. One is that like that's like uh, important part of the process is to be monitoring like when things get tedious or like time consuming, which is what mm-hmm. you've done. And the other thing is that. Um, the way you push through tedium, a, AKA, how do you not be lazy is that you have to love it. Like, I know that sounds like dramatic yeah, again, no, but no, it's no, like it. the love has to come from somewhere, whether it's like you love like the Zen of being in the zone, putting on rock music and doing that tedious part, or it's that you love seeing like the look on someone's face when you give them the board right. or like sure. it, there has to be a source of Something love. Right. And if there isn't, right. it's, it's going to fall apart. Yeah, because I think I've even heard, like, people define the passion actually means not having some excitement or enthusiasm, but sort of being willing to suffer, right, through something, uh, for sure. And I have, though, and it has crossed my mind because the thoughts crossed my mind about asking for more money, but I actually have it. Mm-hmm. Okay, so yeah, you're through on that. Right? You're living that. And yeah, I'm living it, and I've given away more because I've been hesitant. Like I, I actually made one for a guy um, who has his own little rock climbing uh, accessories company that he he runs, Dirtbag Climbers, and um, 
I was trying – I wanted to make one for him to see if he would sell them on his store, and he's kind of like uh, – What's the word I'm thinking? Of? Like his response has been a little tepid. Like, yeah, this looks cool. He likes them, but he, you know, he doesn't want to commit to anything. And um, and I ended up just giving it to him because I was like, ah, you know, it's kind of seeing his response as being lukewarm. I, it just felt I just didn't feel comfortable asking him for money for something that he didn't ask for, right? That I proactively made to see if he'd like it or not. And he and he did like it. Um, and he's come back and be like, yeah, we could totally put these on my store, but. It's all very much just a reaction to me. Not, I'm not seeing like an organic, like pull from him yet, right? So I, I, I literally I gave it to him yesterday, and he's like, "You sure I don't need anything for this?" <laughs> you know, and I like turned it down. I'm like, "Nope, you could have that one, right? Maybe the next one, right? Or we could sell one. We'll, we'll figure that out later. Mm -hmm. Just want to consider it just a gift." <laughs> Right, which is a nice place to be able to be in. Like, oh yeah, that's like a dirty little secret too of professional artists is that, you know, it's like, wow, how did he make it and he not make it? And oftentimes the answer is like, his fa his family owns real estate or his wife is rich or like yeah, somehow um, he's got a way to. Mm -hmm. So it's he like or she, right? Right. So like your your hangboards like. If the if it becomes a viable business that draws like a salary for some like you or your son, it's probably going to be because it's being subsidized by your, your day job. yeah your day job, which is yeah. not anything to be ashamed of. It's just like no, no. should be aware of it for at all. growing and like understanding how things like the world works. Yeah, I mean, I've even been rationalizing to myself like how much free crap I promotional crap I get. Right. Um, I mean, even last night. I donated a, a hangboard for an event. This, it was this uh, people of color night at the Rock Gym. That is this organization that's trying to bring more um, of equality and like exposure of like outdoor sports to underserved communities in inner cities. Um, and there was a little rep there from the Patagonia store in Buckhead, right? It's like Patagonia is like top of the line, expensive, high tech outdoor gear. And consistent with some of the other designs I'm doing, I'll just make one that says horse pens 40 on it, right? Like a trailhead sign. And then I was like, like, they'll love that as much as anybody. Like, why should I assume that they need something special, right? Like not just whatever the, the climbing community would think is cool anyways. Um, and I mentioned that to the organizers and they were like, yeah, absolutely. That's the whole point, right? Like they don't at, at the same time, although they need help getting exposed to it, they really don't want or need like special treatment in some way either right it's just just acceptance into the community as the community exists uh which was pretty cool and it's pretty cool hearing my son's response too because he he was pretty impressed by the whole thing and he's like yeah everywhere we go and especially when he's competitive when he goes to the the regional tournaments he's like there's never any black people around there might be one guy right or one girl uh, and that's it. Or occasionally there'll be like one Asian kid, um, or uh, you know, Latin or Hispanic-looking person, but they're very rare, right? Usually it's just very white. Um, and like rock climbing is like I would, I think it, I would love to expose everybody to it. I mean, even you, Sean, if you ever get curious or want to go, because it's such an awesome thing of like the sense of accomplishment that you get as you're able to make improvements and. Is even though there's a community there and there's people and you're always – it's impossible not to compare yourself to other people. At the end of the day, it's just like between you and the rock, right, which is a part of the earth. And it's just – it it really builds a lot of like character and self-confidence. Um, and you just see that in a lot of people. And the look on people's faces when they finish climbs that they've been struggling with is – priceless you know a, bu uh, a buddy of mine took me for his birthday like you, you know you have that uh -huh. carte blanche to kind of like yep. push someone yeah, yeah. out of their comfort zone yeah. and and it was like uh i don't want to say like life-changing but it, it did open my eyes like i didn't even think i could do it at all right and then to realize oh no i could do it like i can't do the hard stuff but i can right. do some stuff and yeah 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 there's a little bit of a hurdle there there's a lot of the whole – there's a lot – I mean that's – like all rock climbing is mental hurdles. Like it, it ne that never goes away. The climbs just get harder, right? So you're constantly like overcoming that, um, and, which is awesome. And you see that people like – I love when you see new people. Like I spend a lot of time at the rock gym with my kids there. So you always see some people in there, 
and they feel they're like kind of sheepish and they're struggling. And I'm like, dude, we like, I was exactly where you were. It was just 15 years ago. Right? <laughs> like we all started that same way. And this, uh, color the crag event and people of color, like they were saying, the one thing about rock climbing though, is it is something that's very difficult to do by yourself. Like you need, you do need somebody to introduce you to it and like push you into it because it doesn't feel natural. It's dangerous. I mean, they made some comparisons to like skateboarding, like other sport, like skiing or, or, or surfing, but those are things that you can, you can kind of get on a skateboard by yourself and go scoot around and kind of teach yourself how to skateboard. But like rock climbing, I don't think is something that you can really do on your own from scratch in isolation. It's just way too risky and it's too weird. There's like, like there's like ropes involved. And, yeah, there's yeah. ropes and there's a safety element. It is, it is dangerous. And, uh, at a minimum, you should have somebody around because if you do happen to get hurt, at least there's somebody there that can help you or go get help. Right? Also, like this might be a derail here, but I think rock climbing is special because it it um, allows a certain type of body type to to have its like like a place to excel. Like so many sports, like the taller and bigger you are gives you a natural advantage. Right. But yeah. like for climbing, you know, you're, it's like trying to launch a rocket, you know, the, the weight to, um, yeah, the strength to weight ratio. Yeah. Big is it, deal. is a big deal. So like, it truly is like a, a, a cool niche for, you know, like if you are naturally like lean, like marathon running becomes a little easier, I think. And if you're yeah. super tall, like basketball seems to have like a little bit easier of a chance to dunk. Yeah. And like for rock climbing, there is, you know, I see like, um, you know, young women who feel empowered that like, this is something that I can do that my dad can't do sometimes. And that's pretty right. fun and cool. Absolutely. Yeah. If anything, I was lucky enough to be taught by a woman when I first got introduced to her. She was a high school teacher. Um, and I, re I still remember to this day, she was talking about how, like, in general, this is a huge generalization, but, like, women learn better because, like, rock climbing is a combination of strength and technique. And as actually as harder it gets, it's more about technique and less about strength. Like there is a minimum amount of strength that you need. It's like an ante to just play, but it's really a lot more about technique. And because women tend to not have as much uh, muscle mass, they have to develop their technique first where guys, especially when you're teen, you just sort of have a lot of upper body strength. And then you, you kind of get uh, like overly used to doing, using your, your strength, right? And that becomes a drawback as you get further back. And you almost have to, like, you'll see guys where they almost have to sort of downgrade themselves a little bit to get away from the strength piece and develop their technique that a lot of women don't have to do that. Because you can develop, it's easier to develop your strength moving forward, right, than to, like, overcompensate with strength and then dial back and try to learn to, and kind of undo bad habits to get technique, which is always real cool to right. see that. When I was... um right out of school, I, I started trying to get into jujitsu just because I was, sure. there was a gym like near me, which was like cool. an opportunity. And, uh, yeah, they were, they were saying that it's like, if you came in like, like muscle bound, like you're, you almost are never going to learn the techniques, right? <laughs> because right. you're always going to like, mu like, f like cheat basically. Yeah, exactly. And there is this, this like, uh, I don't, know, hard, I don't know if hardcore climber is the right word, but kind of people that really climb a lot in that lifestyle. Like there's this like underlying like inside joke about like the big stocky dudes that show up to climb and get completely shut down that they can't climb, right? And it's like very demoralizing or embarrassing in your because because they're focused on building strength like bodybuilding versus the climbing is a some level of a sport, right? I don't know. It's, sometimes calling it a sport, it feels a little funny, but but there's a lot of technique involved and, and there's a mental game involved beyond just pushing a lot of weight around, right? Or just being strong for the sake of being strong. Um, I've also seen too where, to your point, like I think a lot of people that are larger feel intimidated by climbing because they because of that, they got the higher weight and you just see really good climbers tend to be small and petite but um, 
which turns people off, right? Turns people off that are larger. But it, again, there's so much technique involved that that people that I think it can accommodate any body size, really, um, and style any body type. But if people just give it the chance to do that, and then when you see large, a lot of times you see large people and they they do struggle on the wall. But then when you see some people that actually have some technique, and it doesn't matter how big they are, and they're able to kind of crush up a wall. That's really impressive too. And you're like, yeah, they they got it right. They figured it out. Um, we actually we actually describe a lot of our climbing routes as problems. It's like a problem solve. It's literally like a puzzle, physical puzzle between your body and the rock, and you solve the problem. So if your weight, you know, whether you weigh a lot or you weigh a little, that's one of the variables in the problem that you're trying to solve, right? to get up this rock or get up this wall or whatever it is, which is pretty cool. I have a story for you, but do you, can you tell me the name of that fellow that was in the documentary that won the Oscar, that, that famous oh, climber? Alex, Alex Honnold. Alex Honnold. So like right yeah. now he's kind of having a, a bit of a moment as they oh, say. Yeah. Absolutely. And um, that reminds me of like maybe now, like we're talking about 2006 back then there was a, there was another climber <laughs> named sure. Matthew Barney, who was an artist and he had a moment <laughs> where cool. um, he did this performance art where he climbed the Guggenheim. Oh, wow. Like, inside. Uh-huh. And um, it was like, he he came in like a hurricane. Like, he, you know, he, he was just like... It was he big in, like, scaling buildings? Like, oh, part of his well, stick or whatever? Well, his thing was that he had been a college athlete, and then uh-huh. he transitioned by, like, he would do these things called drawing restraints. Like, he would, to over some fight, like, attach, like... You know, you you have climbing ropes or what have you. He would attach uh-huh. like a pencil to one of them, and as he was climbing like a pendulum, the the pencil would drag and make marks. And oh, so wow. the, the performance would be one thing, and then this residue of the like the struggle yeah, of his it, body it, it, created the movement the or the, the the image. Yeah. Did you talk about this guy? <laughs> Like a month or two ago. Oh, I was like pitching that like I'm gonna make your son watch him someday <laughs> oh, <laughs> because because wow. it's like th- this is the first thing my mind goes to when cl- when climbing comes out. Yeah. Um, and like he like similarly he kind of like I don't know say popularized a type of video art that at the time was you know kind of fledgling okay. maybe. Uh, okay. Um, but I remember it so vividly because like uh this guy this teacher had introduced it to us and he was like, well, what do you guys think? And I was like, at the time, you know, just a stupid kid <laughs> saying yeah. like, I don't know, like it kind of seemed a little artificial. Like, yeah, like if it was, if he had filmed it like a film on the location, I could have been more immersed, but it kind of felt like, look at me, I'm in an art museum. And, mm. and his answer was that like an art museum is a place. <laughs> and like, yeah. it didn't necessarily like shut me up, but I was like, yeah, I have to consider that it's like, I have these like preconceived notions of what you're allowed to do or what you should do or, and that like, you don't have to be beholden to them. Okay. But yeah. Cool. A little bit of a crossover between the art and climbing world yeah, again. Yeah, that's interesting. That's cool. Um, yeah, there's definitely, I mean, that's what the art crosses over in every aspect of life. Cause it's a kind of a human, uh, it's communication. It's it's communication. It's it's part of the human condition. It's art is a drives culture, right? Um, for sure. Although I am curious now. You mentioned the jujitsu thing. Did you actually uh, do jujitsu for a while? Yeah. So like, uh, this is I don't know. It could be a whole thing, but you know, uh, just by luck, in Athens, Georgia, there was this place called the Hardcore Gym, which at that uh-huh. time, like. I like I was going to my university gym and I would see these guys rolling around on the floor yeah. and then I was like maybe I should ask them what they're doing like the next month basically they had been they got into like the UFC <laughs> Oh wow and then off the strength of that they opened up a gym in their hometown which happened to be Athens Georgia Uh-huh and I was working as a designer and uh I had this project where this fellow had been a athlete and then he had been become like a quadriplegic and I was supposed to like um, design the cover to his book that he had kind of dictated. Uh-huh. And he said, like, he's like, do you know about this hardcore gym? And I was like, yeah, that sounds awesome. I wish I could do that. And he's like, well, why can't you? Yeah, and and it, 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 it like hit me that it's like this guy, if he could get up right now, this is what he'd do. What's my sure. excuse? Right. So like, I was basically kind of like trying to take that on <laughs> and use it as an excuse and. 
Yeah, so it was like jujitsu specifically oh, towards the mixed martial arts, like a couple years. Wow. Um, but and it was it was awesome. Like I couldn't have predicted how cool it would be because like the the football team would come in every once in a while and just like kick our butts and <laughs> you it like you you don't really know you know like you see people on TV and you're like think you wonder like how would I stack up and it's like I found out real quick not at all like they might as well be another species. <laughs> It was like a mouse being like, I wonder if I ever had the chance to fight a gorilla. Would I, would I survive? Um, and the thing that I learned real quick was that it's like the only thing you could do was like get into a position where you could try to clinch really hard. Like yeah, that's like a grapple. Like, yeah. Yeah, you gotta grapple. And, and, and yeah, in and, and a, a completely defensive posture. And, yeah. <laughs> and then it came around years later, my, uh, my younger sister's boyfriend is actually a jujitsu coach. So like he he's like kind of kept it like passively a part of my life to like you know, invite uh-huh. people friends over to 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 roll as they call it. <laughs> wow, cool! I had no idea. That's so funny. Like it just makes me think. Like when I was in middle school, like I was totally fascinated by ninjas. Like want to be a ninja. Um, I remember in elementary school, I had a friend that was. I think he did taekwondo. But, like, my parents just, like, refused to let me do taekwondo, taekwondo at the time. I went to, like, the one free session, right, where they try to get you get you in. Um, they always had excuses. Now, in retrospect, now that I'm an adult, I think they just didn't want to pay for it, right, or they couldn't afford it or whatever. But it was always no. Um, I had another friend. He was a little bit bigger. And we were both, like, I remember we would go to the library and get books on, ninja, like, ninja books. Um and so whatever we could learn by reading a book and like half ass practicing, but we never really grappled. We were more interested in like, like, I guess what I would read is a little bit of like the folklore of ninjas where it was like sneaking around, being an assassin that doesn't get caught. And we weren't really interested in assassinating people, but like the idea of like sneaking around and like the kind of, this was before I knew what parkour was, but kind of that more parkour aspect of it rather than like, than like fighting or wrestling. Um, but even to this day, like I still use some of the techniques I learned that to like sneak around my house if I have to get up early, right? And I don't want to wake anybody up or I've tried not to wake up the dog. Like the book described like ways to walk to how to walk on a creaky floor, right? I remember there was a chapter on that. Um, and how to deal with like the creaking of the floor panels to minimize noise. And um, I still do that from time to time. It's, it's kind of fun. Actually, it, it reminds me of being a kid. Right? It's, speaking of being a kid and being interested in ninjas, I actually have a ninja story myself that ties into being a maker. So it's like yeah. a perfect setup. But so were you young enough to care about the Ninja Turtles around that time? Oh or? yeah, absolutely. Okay. So when I was in kindergarten, that was like the, the thing, like the toys, wow. the show. And uh-huh. Naturally, on the playground, we would play Ninja Turtles. Turtles. So you get in cohorts of four, and then everyone calls out what turtle they want to be, and everyone would say Leonardo. Yeah. <laughs> and and I like as they were saying Leonardo, I'd be the only one to be saying Donatello. Uh-huh. <laughs> and my reasoning was that Donatello was the guy who made stuff. Like he uh, was the he? genius. Yeah. Like yeah, whenever they like needed to do something, like he would make the van that would get them there. Or if like ah, we need to track something, and then he would know. make the tracker. And right. so from my perspective, you know, I was having my own authentic experience, thinking like, you know, I wasn't being influenced. I was like, that's what I thought was where agency existed. Right. Whereas everyone else was seeing, this is the guy with two swords. He's the leader. He's the boss. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, want, I remember for us, it was more about what weapon they had. And we were like fascinated with nunchucks. And I think, I don't know if they were really, I think we had this like urban legend that nunchucks were illegal where I was. I don't know if that's true or not. Right. But, and then like, at least for me growing up around my circle friends, like we were convinced that Bruce Lee died where he accidentally hit himself in the head with nunchucks. <laughs> <laughs> and that was like our folklore that we re- truly believed. Um, so we were just, it was all about the nunchucks, right? So I, I was never that into the Ninja Turtles. Remember their names clearly like which one had which weapon, but, but for us it was like, you know, who got to be the guy with the nunchucks was what it was all about. <laughs> And, that's awesome. and it's funny too. Now I got kids, 
and um, they're their own individual people. So they're they're like loud and not slamming doors, right? But sometimes I'll be like, God, why you got to be closing the door so hard or stomping around, right? When I was your age, I was trying to be a ninja, right? Like trying to close the door as quietly as possible. No one would, no one would know where I was coming and going and stuff. Uh, so it was kind of funny. I had a relationship with nunchucks too because – in Filipino mythology, there's this guy named Dan Inosanto. He's a real guy, but just the fact that he trained with Bruce Lee and he allegedly oh. was the one who introduced him to nunchucks. Oh, because cool. there's this art form called Ernest de Mano, which means like harness of the hand. And uh, it was like nunchucks and like those type of that type of fighting related to the it, the flip side of ninjas, which was that like ninjas were like these mercenaries whose job it was to murder, right? Like their job right. was to attack and yep. if you were in the field you fought with whatever you had in your hand which would be yeah, like absolutely. a stick or something <laughs> or like a hoe right. so like that's how as we understood it that nunchucks were like they evolved out of that close combat using a, this like short weapon and it was available right yeah and that the nunchucks yeah. were originally like a scythe or something that kind of got evolved or sure on a chain <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely definitely uh I was aware of that folklore and the, the psi weapons, right? The three pronged sword thing, whatever. I don't know what how you describe that weapon. Um, yeah, cool. Talk about getting off on a tangent. <laughs> Pretty cool though. Um, but um, but yeah, that's definitely one of the things I um, I really enjoy about rock climbing. That's what, the same thing. These hangboards is like it's really kind of talking about um, part of the goal to show some about things we're passionate about, right? Is that this hangboard project is really bringing two things that, that oh, two intersections of things that I'm really interested, or I guess it might even be three things, right? The rock climbing piece, the making of something. And then I have always had an affinity towards art. Um, and I think as I mentioned a couple episodes ago, it was something that my family was sort of ambivalent about or like on the one hand they thought it was cool, but on the other hand, I sort of got disparaging comments and not encouraged to pursue art, which is I think is something I've finally now as an adult figured out a way to tap, tap back into that um, in a way that feels really good. So, well, I actually um, thought about my inspiration for this week, uh-huh. kind of dovetailing into what you and your process, because as um, from my perspective, the hangboards are kind of like you have this making thing where you cut stuff and you do stencils and they, yep. they're kind of like, they didn't have necessarily like a specific form. And then you had climbing. And then when you brought them together, they, they, yeah. they both like kind of it like, kind of popped. yeah, popped in a way. And um, something that was inspiration for me was this artist named Zoe milk. Mm-hmm. And um, what's kind of interesting for me is that it's like, I've only ever known her, through online presence, but I first, you know, saw her work and I thought it was really impressive and it was like technically like, I, I wish I could mimic it. Impressive. Huh? And then, so she started off like most people do and like doing the traditional pencil on paper and would draw like celebrities and it would be so technically, um, sound that you, it showed, demonstrates skill level. Well, <clears throat> While in college, she met this other artist named Kent Williams, who, from reading between the lines, I, I think they're, they are now either married or <laughs> partners in some way. But what was really cool was that he was a comic book artist, and he had like a very kind of painterly loose style for his paintings. Mm. And so she was really very precise and he was very like had this very kind of process oriented layers of paint and layers of color and washes he would do and once they met I mean it was you could track it that all of a sudden she was incorporating that his style into her backgrounds hmm. so like she took her like Did really like, go ahead and that was, I was like and that was like a, a collaboration they were doing or she she was able to grow I was just influ- on his inspiration. Influence. Yeah, yeah, just influence. influence. Yeah. So like yeah, not, not collaboration. I, I could see it happening like in real time, essentially as like oh, her, wow. what started first was her, she was on Blogspot, which was like at a certain time, that was the best way Check to blog. Google's or Google bot. Blogspot, right. So right? It, it bought, and then she 
naturally progressed to her own website and then naturally progressed to her gallery Oh, and then, nice. and like, this is like a life cycle of an artist, right? It's like, you know, you, you make your portfolio and then you do this and it's like, you migrate yeah. naturally. And, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. and so like, I followed her now to like Instagram, <laughs> but, nice. but like, that was a really cool thing. Like you can't always see process and oftentimes people love to hide the process, right? Right. They want to just uh, like evolve and then show up fully formed. And it's like, I was yeah. always amazing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, and, but like that thing of like learning on the job, <laughs> like um, I was using like the kind of vulgar um, metaphor of like, have you ever heard of the Fast and the Furious franchise? Yeah, with yeah, with Vin Diesel. Right. That yeah. like now, like the the next one coming out is called like Hobbs and John or whatever, and it's not even starring Vin Diesel. It's like two secondary characters that have like spun off into their own series. Uh-huh. And how like <clears throat> it's taken like seven movies, but like this franchise has like l- like learned on the job <laughs> is the way sure. I used to st- describe it. Like if you watch the first one and you watch this one, they're like unrecognizably like comparable. Mm-hmm. But that's almost the fun of it. Same thing with like the Rocky franchise. Like you can see Sylvester Stallone like aging and like changing and like his vocabulary getting better and his eyes getting lower and like it's this document of like change over time and now even passing it to another generation like sure like that's a really fun thing to be able to like oh absolutely digest. man that's um definitely i think that's a lot of part of what life is about and uh maybe that's if anything i think that reflects a little bit of like maturity on your part right to appreciate that um god i feel like Getting off on a tangent a little bit, but I had a very similar but less, I think, pronounced experience with the artist. Is it Kandinsky? I think it's Vasily Kandinsky. Is that his name? So I remember, um, never knew who he was. Um, and then there was a movie that came out that had uh, Will Smith in it in New York City. And somehow it's this cross between like some urban guy and like these very rich elite people in New York City, and it somehow like Kandinsky paintings like revolved around that. Does, does that movie ring a bell to you from like maybe the late '90s, early 2000s? What is that? Do you remember what the name of that movie was called? Oh my god, yeah, I can't. I'm again, I'm not a movie buff, so I really can't remember the movie name. But but anyways, they. Like, Kandinsky was, like, this plot element there, right? And I was like, what the hell? Um, and they showed a couple of the paintings, and, and to me, they were, like, that weird abstract art that that non-art people like to make fun of, that that thing's worth millions of dollars, and it looks like somebody just spilled paint, right? Like a kid spilled paint. Yeah, or kitchen. I could do that. or Yeah, yeah. or I could do that. Or I, like, I can't believe you will waste their money on that. Um, so that was sort of my – I didn't even think about it, but sort of my perception of the whole thing. But then – the one time I'm in New York City, which is very rare, and decided to go to the Guggenheim, they had a Kandinsky exhibit going on, a very large one. And as you're walking around the Guggenheim and the circular thing that they've got, you could see the progression of his life, right, and his work, kind of like you described it. And being able to see, like for me, that really, it just changed my perception of him as, it actually changed me to appreciate him as an artist which is not something I'd ever considered or even walking in there. I didn't even know that's what the show they had going on. Right. I was just in New York city and want to go to the Guggenheim. Um, so to see his like life's work and then a couple of the pieces that I, even though they were abstract like that and I, you know, a year or two earlier might've dismissed them being like, Oh, I actually liked that one. Right. And, and I probably liked it more seeing how he progressed um, through his career. It was really awesome. And it was a little bit older, you know, I was a young adult at the time, but still, I think I was maybe a little more mature than I might have been in the past. Um, and that gave me a new appreciate, like a new way to appreciate art that I wasn't even aware of until I, that I had that experience, which was pretty, pretty cool. Yeah. And this um, isn't my story, but it, it's related that um, there was this artist named Cy Twombly who mm-hmm. he made these like big paintings that um, – people weren't getting <laughs> that it has the same sort of qualities that you described of like 
it just looks like scribbles or it like it looks like anyone could do it and mm -hmm. um like according to legend he he was like okay like the galleries aren't understanding my work so he did this painting where he uh had like basically it was like a chalkboard and then he was like showing like the process of what he was doing like he painted like an actual chalkboard and that mm. like that showed like it kind of w created this like entry point into sort of saying like oh that's what's happening like mm. almost like uh um like a insight into the process right like um i imagine like if we use the metaphor of your your hangboards and you you describe them to someone they they don't even quite understand what you're saying and then there's that moment of like showing an Instagram video of your son hanging from one and then it like clicks, you know? Right, right. And, uh, Absolutely. and like you can try to actively finding that, <laughs> that entry point for your audience is kind of interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I'm still working on that. <laughs> that piece out. For, for sure. sure. Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, I gotta tell you for the, uh, May the 4th art show that I'm still having started working on, um, my vision of what I really wanted to do was that um, spoil board from the CNC and have it be inspired or guided by what I saw, like the Kandinsky work that I saw, right? And try to tie that together and make that happen. And actually talking to you right now makes you think, like reinvigorates me. Like I should, that's what I really should try to put some effort, put, see if I, you know, like in a two week period, I can do something that, that gels and have that be the whole thing. Um, as the main project, but we'll see where that ends up. Maybe in a couple, a couple of episodes, we'll, <laughs> we'll talk about that in more detail. Um, cool. It might be a larger conversation, but like, do you, have you had any pulse of other people? Like if anyone else is working on this, this show or are uh, you scared to even check in? <laughs> no, no. Um, good question. So one, I did go trade posters, uh, with, um, Jesse, the main organizer, so we pr I print out some large format posters for her, and she gave me some cardstock uh, flyer kind of things. And she's gotten a lot of traction from the local community, um, the KSU art department, and some other groups that she interacts with. So she's not concerned, which was good, because I was afraid it was going to be just Maker Station. Um, and then um, Brett and Mike have both – like Brett's – Brett's been quite prolific in his making, honestly, with an art artistic bent. So I don't know what he's going to submit specifically, but he's sort of building up a body of work that uh, mostly just sits in a box, right? I think he, he wants to sell it, but he's, he's not motivated by that. He's motivated by making the next cool thing. So I think he's going to have some cool stuff. Um, and actually, even my daughter, I'm actually really excited. My daughter recently... Um, we gave her a drill, a cordless drill for her birthday because um, she's in theater tech and she's using it for building sets. But she, on her own, somehow got inspired to uh, make earrings out of Scrabble tiles, the letters. So she made a couple earrings out of the letter M for her name, and they're pretty cool. And I've I convinced her that she should make some earrings to submit for that show, right, as well. And... She's waffled. She's gone back and forth a little bit, flip flop. Said she'll do it, then she, then she said no, and then she said yes. But I'm hoping that, that um, she might have a few little things that she can submit as well. So that's pretty. That's got me excited, um, for sure. And then I assume you're. Are you sticking with the, the Lego art theme paint boxes, or well, is that one yeah. of the couple of different things you're doing? Yeah, I had kind of like a couple things cooking. You've probably seen some on Instagram. One is that. I did this painting of from Crocodile Dundee. <laughs> yep. Um, so that's one. And then um, I'll save, like, the punchline of that one. But, like, the other thing I started was um, my friend's daughter, she's, like, three years old. Uh -huh. She drew me this picture of Wonder Woman. Yep. And so I, like, did, like, a untuned version where, like, I painted an oil painting version using her color scheme. And I okay. thought I would, like, present them together, like, our, our two Wonder Womans. Oh, cool. Like, and I, especially because, like, I'm trying to think of, you know, this is, like, a, a space kids play-in and stuff. Like, that would be a little bit aspirational or, like, that's, like, show them, like, you can do it kind of thing. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, 
but like I I still kind of feel like I'm dropping the ball. <laughs> Maybe you feel that way too. Really? And it's like I feel like like the this subject matter, the geek pop culture thing. It's like it's like it's such a great opportunity. Like I, I haven't really knocked it out of the park yet. I don't <laughs> think. <laughs> yeah, I'm starting to feel a little bit of anxiety about it, um, for sure. But but no, it sounds like you've got some diversity. I was curious if you're gonna have like a diversity of things or if it was gonna be very much focused on just like Lego theme, but it sounds like you got a, a couple different things going on there. You're definitely further along than I than I am on it. I still just have ideas. <laughs> well, I think it's like a, a defense mechanism where the I always first try to do something quickly so I can just be um, a good soldier, uh-huh. right? So like the thing you're describing about the um, – the spoil boards and that it's like very artistic and like it, it's relevant to you and you're not even sure how you'd pull it off yet. Uh-huh. That's the thing you do and see, like if it works, it works. But then like the, uh, the coward in me or the good soldier in me says like, first just do something you know you can do. So you'll be like, you'll make the, the gallery happy. And that, mm-hmm. that's what my Lego thing was. And then it's like, okay. if, if it goes, if something goes wrong, the guy who's going to sell me a spoil board backs out, I drop the spoil board. I don't want to just say, like, sorry, I couldn't do it. Like, that's like a flaky thing artists do. Is it? Okay. I, I try to never be that guy. <laughs> like, the, the thing I offer galleries is that I'll be professional, <laughs> if that's nothing cool. else, right? Sure. So, like, do the Lego thing. I know it's, like, a certain level of success I can promise. And that then have, right. if I have something better. And also, like, a little peek behind the curtain. If you do prove that you're competent, you'll get yeah. way more leeway. So I've had galleries where I sh- like I submitted work, and uh-huh. then I was like, I'll be honest with you, I don't think this will hang on your wall well. I'd like to show this instead, and they're like, great. <laughs> huh. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. But, I mean, to each their own. Some people, they fly by the seat of their pants and have ten times more success. Yeah, I don't know. I'm definitely... Uh, trying something new here in this space i'll be curious to see how it how it pans out Mm -hmm. just as like a thought exercise you know what i mean like you could like in a day cut a stencil or something right you Mm -hmm. could you could make like a hangboard that has like a a, that says may the fourth like you could do that yeah yeah in one day and then you're like okay now i don't have to stress (laughs) right that's true um yeah we'll see we'll see about that I was thinking, so we got invited to another, I think they're calling it like maker market. It's like a flea market thing at Freeside down in Atlanta, the Freeside maker space at the Metropolitan. And um, that's in April. That one, I was thinking about making some hangboards for that. And that actually, it wasn't now, I always get hung up on something. Now it's not making the hangboard piece is like, can I make a little contraption rig that allows me to set up the hangboard where people can actually try doing pull-ups off of it, right, to make it functional? Because right now what I've done at the I'm, – I'm even at rock climbing events, but the dang hangboard is sitting there on a table where people can look at it and touch it, but it's not set up somewhere we can actually use it. Um, and I'm trying to think – the thought's starting to cross my mind. It's like, okay, how could I build something that's both strong enough – and cheap enough and lightweight enough and that it fits in my car, you know, like the four, like the four constraints that there's no way you can actually hit all four of them. <laughs> you know, I was like, should I try to make it out of steel or is it, is it collapsible or not? It, it, will it actually be strong enough or it's going to tip over and, and crack somebody's head open? Right. Mm-hmm. That's my fear. Or maybe you make one that's just for kids to hang on, so it's like a little smaller. Oh, smaller. God, that's even worse. That's <laughs> probably even riskier on this. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> but we'll see. That one's coming up faster. That's coming up in April, so I need to get off the ball. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we're winding up, winding down, but I have a uh, what I fixed this week for you. Oh, all right. Yeah, let's hear it. So this is going to sound crazy, or maybe it doesn't. Maybe it sounds normal, but to me it's it felt crazy, but... Um, so I walk my dog twice a day, once in the morning and once in the evening. And because of that, like everyone sees me all the time. Okay. (laughs) People honk at me and like, you know, the joggers will like wave or whatever. Wave. Okay. So I was walking my dog and a woman said, 
oh, hey, you know, do you remember me? Are you, are you tech savvy? <laughs> and I said, uh, in some ways, you know, and she was like, my daughter gave me a Roku for Christmas and I, like, I've worked on it every day since and I haven't gotten it working. Do you think you could set it up for me? So this is a neighbor. Yeah. Well, like, yeah. Kind of on the street. Yeah. Like. Interesting. Yeah. Not like a next door neighbor. Sure. So I didn't even know where she lived or whatever. And so I was like, okay, sure. Can I, you know, exchange numbers? And she was like, I don't have my phone on me. And I was like, okay, well, do you want to give me your number and I could call you or something? And then she basically was like saying like, can you just do it now? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I was like, you know, it almost sounds like how a bad movie plot. Right. Yeah. But, <laughs> but then I was amused by the fact that it's like, I could do something helpful and also like sure. if I die, whatever, <laughs> I've had a good run. So <laughs> me and my dog walk with her back to her house and, her husband's in there and he's doing his taxes and he's like, what, who's this guy you're yeah, bringing? Heck? <laughs> and I was like, you know, we can do it another time. And he's like, yeah, let's do it another time. And she's like, no, let's do it now. <laughs> so we, we go in eventually. Um, and like, it's the whole process, you know, trying to work with technology for people that, you know, it's not their most fluent subject. Wow. We, we get it figured out. Turns out I went to school with her daughter both high school and college, but was one year apart. Wow. And, but the, 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 yeah, the cool punchline was that her husband taught at Georgia tech and like way back in the day. Oh, and, uh, so he, I think I'm reading between the lines and he was like trying to show me that it's like, I used to be into technology at some point. Right. Yeah. That's what I was going to laugh. I'm like, that's so <laughs> typical that like some tech professor can't even get it together enough to run new tech, right? Right. So, like, he, like, I hope he he's he won't miss it. But like to thank me, he he gave me this handwritten book, like a, his notebook that he kept of how to how to design circuits, like physical circuits. What? Yeah. So, like, I was like, no, it's fine. Like, I don't mind. He's like, please take it. And I, also, there's probably the thing of like. No one in his family cares about what he did, you know. <laughs> like, like they, it's like, yeah, right, Dad. You know, like they they have no value for it. So he was right. like, this is someone that could might value it. And they're like these exquisite drawings and like, you know, him problem solving. <laughs> how did to make he, these... he just he just assumed that you would enjoy it, like based on the conversation you were having. Because that sounds like it could be potentially a little awkward too, right? Yeah, for sure. Like oh, it was awkward. Yeah. Well, yeah, and like just in terms of like I. I, I don't even understand how how it works myself, so I don't even know like how big a deal it is for him to give it to me. Hmm. And um, but like I was thinking, like the wheels were turning in my head. I was thinking maybe I could ask Brett to like laser cut one of his drawings on Ooh, a piece of wood, yes. yeah, and absolutely. then I could like present it to him, and it, he would like that would like blow his the blow his mind. <laughs> maybe I don't know. Absolutely, dude. I'd like to see some of those too. I might be able to do something there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll send sure. you some like scans or whatever. I actually have a. Um, I worked for uh, General Electric, right? And uh, God, a long time ago, when I was going through training, the large generators at power plants, the really big ones, are still like the technology is actually pretty old, and they're they're kind of built by hand. These big electric generators. And I remember seeing a, a winding diagram for a generator that I just saw it as like a – it wasn't a blueprint, but it was like a drafting drawing, just black and white line drawing. But the way that the pattern that it makes, it's kind of got this weird symmetry to it, was like this would – I would love to paint, like convert this into a work of art, like modern art, right, with like, like bright – yeah. Well, the symmetry of it was gorgeous, and I think if you added some color, like kind of like a like a yellow electric color tone to it, it would be. I think I think at least in my head, it's cool, right? I'd love to try it, but at that time, I wasn't savvy or motivated enough, or actually going to fall through on it to get the damn drawing that that needed. So I just kind of have this fuzzy memory of it <laughs> sure and now i don't have access to those drawings anymore or know how to even go find one and now it's like 
that so you just saying this guy had these exquisite drawings in there made me that kind of reminded me of like oh there might be something in there that we could do something really cool with yeah i mean for oh. sure you would probably understand the technical side of it more than i would so like for me it would basically be like a dog looking at a shadow <laughs> but like for you you could be like no this does this yeah <laughs> especially if it's electrical electrical is something i struggle with actually a oh lot, so um <laughs> But no, I mean, I might understand some of the concept, but sure, sure. to me, it makes it more interesting, right? More mm-hmm. artistic, because to me, there's still a lot of mystery. Like, I actually joke to myself, the self-deprecating joke that, like, there's there's still, like, a lot of magic in electricity. There's, even mathematically, there's a mathematical concept called imaginary numbers that you need, that you, you they have multiple uses in the physical world, but one of them is dealing with um, AC alternating current in particular. Um, which is kind of like, kind of mind blowing, right? <laughs> like, you got this stuff so crazy, uh, abstract. You got to literally define something and you, you call it an imaginary number. Um, that blows my mind and whatnot. So, my version of that's light, the waves and particles, oh. and yeah. Well, it's because it's light and electricity are very closely related. They're part of the same phenomenon. Absolutely. Cool, man. Yeah, you have to bring that down. Uh, we'll have to get together and, and take a look at that. Is it, is it just like one notebook, or did he give you a little stash? He gave me one, but, uh, you know, if if I give him a reason, he might dig up more. I, don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I was even wondering if you maybe knew Lou, who we met, he met through Georgia oh, Tech, yeah, like depending on the yeah. time frame. So he's retired now? He's yeah. Older. Apparently he was like he was like uh, poached by Coca-Cola. I don't know if this is like insider information, but like he, yeah, he left Georgia tech to work as a engineer for Coke as an electrical engineer. I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Probably pretty good. Yeah. yeah that sounds pretty, uh, liable. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I'll be excited to have your take on it. Maybe so you, we could do something. You got, you fixed the Roku. You got it working. <laughs> yeah. It's from yeah. recording, uh, recording, live tv right well it's it's, or they sling? it's basically like for streaming so like you could watch netflix or hulu or anything else through it and i like set them up with like the free ones basically so they wouldn't have to worry about that cool yeah nice work dude <laughs> thanks all right <laughs> anything else we need to cover no i think i think we're good for tonight we're we'll definitely hit the hour mark so appreciate okay. it We'll talk to you soon. All right. Bye. It's a lot. Bye. Find more information at doubleprimer.com.